I'm so glad you've joined us, whether you're here or online. Thank you for being here today. I know God has something in store for each and every one of us, and I'm so grateful uh, just to be in the house. Not just because it's cool in here or maybe cool where you find yourself at today, but uh, I'm glad you're here. And I'm excited for this, this series that we're in, this Beatitudes series, uh, some amazing things that have happened. I'm, I'm excited for next week. It's going to be Father's Day, you know. So it's okay. It's like, yeah, it's Father's Day. It's, it's, yeah, I guess we got to do that. Uh, no, I'm excited. Pastor James is going to be in the house next Sunday preaching to us on Father's Day. It's going to be a great day. I'm looking forward to that. So make sure you bring your, your, your dad, you bring uh, your, the father figure of your life, you, you bring uh, your spiritual dad, you, you uh, bring the baby daddy, bring them in here so they can find Jesus. Bring everybody in this place and let's have an amazing Father's Day at New Life. That sound okay? All right, so hopefully I can move past that statement. Today, beginning week number two of this Beatitude series and really these Beatitudes are the preamble to Jesus's, I feel the greatest sermon he ever preached, Sermon on the Mount, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapters five, six, and seven, these Beatitudes really set the tone uh, for our lives. They are a roadmap, if I could say that, for how we should live and emulate Christ. Uh, some of us are trying to become like him. Let me tell you, these teach us, these countercultural truths and principles teach us what it means to become Christ-like, to bear the image of the one so that when the world sees us, they don't just see me, they see him through me. Because I, I can tell you this, the world is not looking for more religion or religiosity. They need Jesus. They need a relationship with Jesus. They need the love, the joy, the peace, the goodness of Jesus. And my hope is that through this series, we can become more like him so when that the world sees us, they see the one who set us free. And what he can do for me, I'm sure he can do for them as well. And so uh, when we kicked this off last Sunday, we gave you two, two observations that, that really are, are, are important for us to grab a hold of, especially as we dig into this. The first one is this, is that each of these Beatitudes begin with the word blessed, blessed. And some translators uh, use the word happy uh, are those, and, and that they use the word happiness to equate it. And I think that that can be, a poor translation for some of us simply for the fact that we, 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 sit, we see it through our natural eyes that when I'm happy, I'm happy, and when I'm not happy, I'm not happy. But that's not biblical happiness. Biblical happiness is a joy that's unexplainable because we, are, we serve and we trust in a God who shows up in our lives and keeps us. And this is found, this joy is found in the most unexpected places, like in these statements. The joy that God is in control, that he is present, and that because we have him, no matter where I am, no matter what's going on, I am okay as long as I have God. The second observation is that each of these, these Beatitudes ends with the words, for theirs is, or for they are. And that's something that we need to make sure we grab a hold of because when you give your life to Jesus, that's not the end. That's just the beginning. That's just a starting point. That's when you get into the game and you finally start living. And he says, I've come that you might have life and that more abundant. It's, it's, it's about where you begin to walk out who God made and shaped you. And, and you begin to experience more of God. And, and I don't know about you, I want more of him. That's why I'm here today, I want more of God. And I know you do too. And so when you begin to step into this, you will experience more of him in your life. So last week we started this series by talking about blessed are the poor in spirit. Today, we're gonna get into probably the strangest one of them all. So I want you to help me as we look at this, Matthew chapter five, verse four. Let's read this together, shall we? Because I want you to join in on the fun. One, ready, set, go. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Yeah, I told you. Are you saying happy are the sad? Are you saying that, 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 that happy are those that are, are sad? That's ludicrous. And yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I can see why you could say that, but I, I think there's something powerful and profound that we're gonna learn here today, and that is this, that God shows up in unique ways to those who are experiencing a bad day. God shows up in the most challenging circumstances, and he's present. And it's something that, truthfully, it's hard to have an, explana an explanation for. Because your bad experience may not be mine, and mine may not be yours. But there's something powerful that happens when you're in the middle of it, and you have nowhere to turn but God. And God is able to show up and meet you there in a powerful and a comforting way that carries you through no matter the situation. If I could rewrite this verse to, to, to say it this way, I'd say that there is happiness even in difficult days because we will experience provision, the purpose and the presence of God. You're gonna experience God. Now you can tell by the passage and how quiet it got in here, that this is a pretty serious topic. Now I don't mind serious, I, 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 I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a psychotherapist, so I sit with people when they're crying and I can do that. But I think we need to bring some levity to this space. So I'm gonna tell you something that I hope makes you laugh, it has nothing to do with my message other than the fact that laughter is good medicine and we need to kind of bring some balance in here as we get started, is that okay? Okay, so there was a new preacher that came to town and he went out uh, on a Saturday to go visit some of the new members, get acquainted with them, to say hello and to get to know them. And he comes up to this one house and it was pretty obvious that somebody was there and he knocked on the door, but no one answered. Knocked again, nobody answered. And knocked a third time, nobody answered. Oh, you know y'all been there when somebody knocking on the door and you ain't answering that door. And so he takes out a card and he writes a passage of scripture on the card, Revelations chapter three, verse 20. He slips it in the door and carries on and Sunday morning comes and he's getting the connect cards and all those things and he happens to see that in that pile of things was his, uh, the business card that he had left at that person's house. And notated next to the verse he wrote was another verse, Genesis three and verse 10. Well, if you were to go and look up later on what uh, Revelation says, 3 and 20, it says that, well, I'll find it. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come to them and I will have dinner with them and them with me. Okay. Well, Genesis 3, 10 says this. I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. <laughs> <laughs> So stop knocking on the door, okay? <laughs> Thank you for letting me do that, bringing some, now we're a little bit more relaxed in here, okay? I believe that if we just make a little bit of space today in our lives, in our heart, especially if you're going through a challenging circumstance, or maybe you're in the middle of the worst day of your life, you're gonna be surprised by the joy that God is gonna give you today. You're gonna be surprised by the peace that you walk out of here with. I believe you're gonna experience something from our Father today. That you can actually have comfort in the midst of your mourning, your broken heart. These Beatitudes are really, as I shared, counterculture because they don't just go against human nature, they also go against some of our Christian nature. Some of our, the theology that we've cultivated out of our brokenness, if I could say it that way, that it's not necessarily what the word says, but it's how we've interpreted the word. And I think there is some things that when it comes to our faith, if you don't understand that God is faithful and you do not begin to understand that just because of his faithfulness, that, do, that does not bring a promise of no pain, you're gonna be disappointed in God. Faith in God doesn't mean that everything's gonna be roses. In fact, I wanna give you three abiding principles that will allow us to build upon today. And the first one is this, is we think bad things should, shouldn't happen to good people. Anybody ever thought that, said that, heard that? 
that bad things shouldn't happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? Like, God, didn't you come so everything could be good? No, he came to bring goodness into the midst of everything. See, to say bad things shouldn't happen to good people is actually bad theology. It's not what scripture says. Because to think that God isn't at work and God is not intervening is to miss what God is doing in each and every one of our lives. We are so very blessed, incredibly blessed. In fact, even on our worst days, we are blessed. Even on our toughest moments, we're blessed. And I think there's times that we can find ourselves, if I could be so direct, is that sometimes we're a little bit spoiled because we're looking to God and we're saying, God, you owe me. You, you owe me a, good things. I mean, I went to serve day yesterday. Come on, God. I mean, I, I, I go to church. I've been reading my Bible. I've been trying to. I skipped numbers because I wasn't into that. But I've been trying to read my Bible. I've been trying to, to be a part. I've been trying to do the right things. I haven't cussed at anybody in two days. So I'm good, God. I've been doing the right thing. Right? And we say, God, you owe me something. And the truth is, God is moving in and through our lives. And it's not dependent upon our actions. God is able to move in and he shows up. And you read in scripture, for example, in Hebrews chapter 11, it's the, what they call the book of faith. And in Hebrews 11, you read stories of these amazing things that God does and, and how he makes miraculous things happen. The Red Sea parting, he, he brings the dead back to life. He, he causes the barren to give birth and all these things. And that's where we like to stop, right? When all the good things are going on. But you, if you fail to read the rest of that chapter, you'll miss out on something that's very profound and powerful where the writer of Hebrews says this, beginning at verse 35, there were others who were tortured, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They, they wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. They, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Let me say this, God had planned something better for us that is greater than anything we could think or imagine. And God is wanting to make us complete and whole. That's why I can stand up here and know that God's not finished with me yet. And you won't just hear my wife say amen. Guy may be able to stand up here. God's not finished with me yet. He's not done working on me yet. He's not done with you yet. That's powerful that God isn't complete. And that's what he's wanting to do is to perfect us, to make us like him. And if I could say this, life isn't fair. I know. I know, God isn't fair. But I'm so glad that God isn't fair because if he was fair, then I shouldn't be here. If he was fair, then I would have to earn the forgiveness of all of my sins, all of my stakes, all of my, my shame, all of the baggage that I carry. But thanks be to God that he isn't fair. And because he isn't fair, he came, bled, and died so that I could live. I'm grateful that God isn't fair because I wouldn't be standing here if he was. Thanks to him. And he showed up in my life, showed up in your life. Paul wrote this in 2 Timothy chapter four. It's, it's, it's at the end of his life. And Paul knew what the end result was be. He was gonna be sentenced to die and be executed. And he penned these words in 2 Timothy chapter four that says this, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. How, how can he say that? Like, you're, you, are you gonna either rescue me or bring me? And the answer is both. Because in that moment, Paul had a profound understanding of the fact that God was going to do both of those things in his life. He was pulling him out of that prison cell and taking him on to something greater. 
I think there's a maturity that has to come because that's a hard place to find ourselves in. But there's strength, there's trust. When we begin to believe in God and realize we are blessed, no matter what the outcome looks like, I am blessed because of God. The second thing is that we think that sometimes pain means we're doing something wrong. Pain doesn't always mean we're doing something wrong. There's a mindset that sometimes we cultivate that, that I, I, I'm afraid of, 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 of do, making mistakes because I don't want God to punish me. I don't want God to, to, to do something or, or, or I don't want bad things to happen. So I'm, I don't want to make mistakes. And, and so when bad things start happening, God, did I, did I sin? Is, did I make a mistake? Did, and we so immediately try to do this thing where we start to look at us or look at him. And this is something that's very counterculture because again, the writer of, of James says it this way, that when you endure things, it says, consider it pure joy. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Now, I don't know anybody in this room who's like, I can't wait to live out this passage. Hallelujah. Bring on all the challenges and all the suffering and, and I'm just gonna give glory to God. <laughs> you're crazy if you're thinking that way. That's tough. I wanna read that for you, not for me. You can gladly live that. I don't wanna live that. Face that. But I don't think the Bible is actually telling us we, we have to act a certain way, no. It's to remind us that God is up to something. Some of you, you think the pain that God is absent in the midst of that, but God is up to something. He's working on your behalf. He didn't create the bad day, but he's gonna use it for something good. The situation, God didn't manufacture that. God, God is a developer, but he's not a developer of that. He's a developer of us. He's more interested in your character than he is your comfort. He's wanted to pull something out of some of you. You're not a finished product yet, so why would God want to allow you to, to rescue you from the very thing that is gonna refine you as pure gold? Sometimes we look at the negative and say, God, what did I do? And God's like, no, I've allowed this to come because I want you to be more like me, but I promise you, I'm never gonna leave you. I'm never gonna forsake you. I'm gonna be with you always, even to the end, and I'm going to help you endure. No matter the situation, you're gonna make it through with me. It's gonna be okay. And before we start thinking God's all bad and everything like that, some of you, you act just like God. Oh, come on, we're parents, some of us in this room. When you, when you come into the kid's room on a Monday morning and they're in there asleep, it's, listen, you don't go in there, hey, listen, would you rather sleep today or go to school today? <laughs> oh, I know some of you. I'll say the PG version. Get your butt out of bed right now, get dressed. If I got up, you gotta get up. Don't make me late. Well, maybe that was PG-13. We'll leave it alone. <laughs> Why? Because school's good for them and the comfort of being in that bed is not what they need right now. It's good for them. James goes on to say in that same writing, he says, perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Anything. I wanna be made whole. I want everything that God has for me. The third thing that I think we need to make sure that we grab a hold of is this. I know we're all smart in this room, but we don't know it all. It's okay, I'll let that sink in for just a moment. You don't know it all. Don't elbow anybody, call them out. Because we've all felt that way, God, I think you're answering this wrong. I didn't pray, I, I, I prayed for this, not that. <laughs> I prayed for you to take care of me and why you show up with a red Geo Metro, Lord? Yeah. How am I supposed to press anybody with that? Junior year of college, 
get in a car accident, all I got now is a red Geo Metro. You see how big I am? I don't know how I got in that red Geo Metro. I don't know how I made up the grapevine half the time, but God knows. Let's just say God didn't show up and give me what I wanted, but thanks God he gave me grace and Ashley looked past the cars because she saw the man, but oh Lord. Some of us the same way in high school, we had this prayer, God, just give me that one. Ooh, Lord, give me that one. That one, Lord, in your name, Lord, let it come my way. But then we show up to our high school reunion, we're like, oh, thank you, Jesus. It didn't work out. Thank you, God, that that wasn't the one. Now to you high school sweethearts, I'm sorry, we're not talking about you. <laughs> oh, Lord, yeah. I'm glad God didn't answer some of those prayers. I'm glad God didn't, I, I'm glad God didn't come in and say, you know what, God, you're so smart. Let's just make it out, work it out your way. No, no, no. That's why Isaiah 55, my thoughts are not his thoughts. My ways are not his ways. As high as the heavens are from the earth are his ways and thoughts above mine. God is greater than those things in my life. And, and I know this, that his way always, always is better. But that can be hard to see. Some of us, I, I, I know that you find yourself in this moment or maybe you're living a season right now where you're walking to the most challenging day of your life. And I don't wanna act like I, I come in and bring so much laughter that I'm trying to make light, I'm not. I, I don't know why some of those things happen. I don't know why situations, why death strikes those that are so young. And we lose things and lose people and relationships end and all of a sudden we, the things that we thought were supposed to last and all of a sudden we, we were left here hurting. It's like, how does this make sense? God, are you even there? How is this, why is this happening? Remember about 12 years ago, Ashley and I were uh, celebrating with friends of ours. So they were about to have their second child. It was truly a miracle they had wanted the child. And that Saturday night, they went in and she went in to give birth. And then we got a phone call early Sunday morning that she had passed in childbirth. I, I didn't know what to do in that moment. As a believer, as a Christian, as a friend, I honestly didn't know what to say. In that moment, I truly felt like a failure as a friend. I, I didn't know what to be for that person. Because when you find yourself in that crisis, the place of heartache and feeling like you have no control, the only thing you can do is look up. But in looking up, you find the one, you find your comforter, you find your king. You find the ability to know that he is God. And as the writer of Isaiah 57 says this, he says, good people pass away, the godly often die before their time, but no one seems to care or wonder why. No one seems to understand that God is protecting them from the evil to come. When I don't know the answer, there are times where I just have to trust that God knows. He didn't cause it, but he's able to use it. Scripture says every good and perfect thing comes from him. There is no evil that can come from God. He does not possess it or, or is able to deliver it. There's nothing on that. But God is able to take our most challenging moments and walk with us. And let us know that even though you have no idea what's happening, I'm here. 
Like some of you, I, there will be a time where I have had this thought, when I get to see him, I, I just have some questions. Jesus, we gonna have a sidebar. But this is where I've come to see throughout scripture and a time spent with him that when I hear him tell me whatever, Scripture says, it's like staring through a glass darkly, but I will see face to face. I will be able to see the why and I'll know. And I don't think there will be a person in this room when you hear him say whatever on that day that we will question him, but we will know that he knew what we didn't. And he'll be able to be the God that comforts us, that the psalmist says that he'll be close to the brokenhearted. So they, we may not have the answers now, but we will have the answers when we see him. So God wants somebody to know in this room today, he's got you. He has you right here, the palm of his hand. I'm gonna give you three things that I think you should either write down, type on your phone, but I, these three things three very practical tools that I believe are gonna help some of you right here in this moment or if, God forbid, whatever may come down the road. And they come from the book of 2 Corinthians where Paul is talking and sharing from his own experience. And he tells the people beginning in chapter one, that we go through the same thing as everybody else in the world. The only difference is, is we got God on our side. And many scholars are, are talk about this, that Paul found himself very hopeless and just based on the reading, almost to the point of suicidal. Yes, Paul, the apostle. As it says in verse eight of 2 Corinthians chapter one, it says this, we were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. It says, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Paul shares three things in here. The first one is this. He tells us to refocus. Refocus. Refocus on what's happening in me, not to me. Refocus on what's happening in me, not to me. He says, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. I want you to remember this in this moment. If something is happening to me, it's because God wants to do something in me. God wants to do something in you. So maybe perspective that we should have is God in the midst of this you know how much I'm hurting what are you teaching me what are you trying to do in me because looking back the moments that I've wanted God to deliver me from I'm so glad that God didn't listen to me because here's the deal as much as in that moment I was saying no 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 I see what God produced inside of me and how he refined me. How I grew. Your pain is either a jail that'll imprison you or it's a school that'll shape you and you get to choose. You get to choose. So we have to refocus. 
The second thing that Paul mentioned in that passage is we need to remember. Remember that God always delivers. He always comes through. He always has, he always will. The best predictor of God's present help is his faithfulness. If you wanna look at who God is, look at how he's been faithful throughout scripture to men and women. He's always shown up and been present. As cheesy as this may sound in this moment, some of you are watching old reruns of old shows. I know I am. Some of us, these dramas in there, they get us on these cliffhangers at the end of these shows or episodes or even the, that, that current series. And, and we're like, well, I wonder what's gonna happen. Well, there's like 18 episodes and series left. Like there's so much more time. It's gonna be okay, right? We look at it as like, okay, we're on season five. Like it continues on to season nine. I think they're gonna make it. They're the main star of it. Jack Barr will not die. He's good. Sorry, I'm watching 24 right now. Don't judge me. I want you to look in your Bible, some of you, when you get home today and flip to that back portion and then go over a couple of pages where it says this, that I heard a loud voice. And here's what the king will say on that day. He says this, now my dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He's gonna wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Can I remind you today that God will not leave you covered and we have a promise one day to spend eternity with him. In the end, we win. There's victory only through Jesus Christ. So the playbook is recognizing that hopelessness is the old way. I have hope because of Christ. So we refocus, we remember, and then lastly, why you're here today. Why God brought you here today. Because we need to learn to rely on solid relationships. You need people in your life. Some of you have been doing this alone. The grief has caused you to pull away from everyone and everything. The, the pain that you're feeling has caused you to separate yourself and that could be the worst thing that you could do. Why? Because we're relational creatures. We need people. I don't just need anybody. I need the right people. I need people that have my back and will pray for me, that will cover me with grace, that will surround me, strengthen me, that will hold me up when I feel like sitting down and letting go and giving up, that will say, no, I got you. We're gonna get through this. I may not be able to experience what you're experiencing, but I'm going to stand with you and I'm gonna fight beside you because I know God's got something for you and we're in this together. Paul was able to get through because of the prayers of others. You need people in your life. We don't just talk about groups because we are looking to give you something to do Monday through Saturday. We talk about groups because we need people in our lives. I wouldn't be here but by people that have covered me, surrounded me, mentored me, pastored me, that told me no, guy, no. You need those people. Before you leave here today, you need to make one connection and maybe that is with our prayer team that's gonna be gathered down here praying over needs. And before you walk out of the door, you need to come up. They're gonna be praying over situations. Connect with them, let them pray with you about your situation. Don't leave here and walk out of here with that sense of loneliness like nobody cares. We're here for you. We're better because of you. That's not just something that's Christianese that we say, no, we are better because of you. This church, the body of Christ needs you needs you. We need each other. Life moves at the speed of relationships. We need each other. So we refocus, we remember, and we rely. And then we allow the God of comfort to be present. And we're able to be blessed in our morning because he is present. 
even on our hardest days. Would you bow with me right now in prayer? Father, I come to you as your children, as your family. God, I have no idea what some of these people are carrying right now. The pain that they're feeling. But may you be present. May they feel that joy, not natural happiness, but that joy to know that you're there with them. May they experience your peace that reminds them that even in the stormiest days, you are the one that's with them in the center of it all. Whether we're here or we're online or whenever we watch us, may the people under the sound of my voice know that you are God. We're God. And if I have you, I have all that I need. With your head still bowed, eyes still closed, I want to speak to somebody today who you walked in here and you don't have Jesus as your Lord and Savior. In fact, you come here today and you searching for comfort, searching for hope searching for Jesus and he wants to come in and be the Lord of your life if you would let him some of you you've followed Jesus in the past you've you've been one of his children but you've turned your life away and maybe the circumstances and the challenges is what brought you here today can I tell you whether you are needing to be introduced to him for the first time or you're trying to get realigned with him. Can I tell you this? It is the best decision you'll make. You will not leave here the same because when Jesus shows up, everything changes. So I wanna know who I'm praying with today that you wanna find Jesus right now. If that's you, on the count of three, I want you to lift your hands so I can pray with you today. One, two, three. Who am I praying with today that wants Jesus to show up in their life and be king and Lord? Thank you, thank you. I see you. I see you there in the back. I see you up here. I see you. I see you over here on the side, my friend. Bless you. Bless you. Put those hands down. I want us to pray together, New Life Family. We don't do anything alone, especially today. Nothing alone. Let's pray this together. Can we say, Jesus, today I give you my life. I go all in. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, come in, be the Lord of my life. I surrender my heart to you. King Jesus, I believe you came and died and you rose again so that I could live. I surrender my life to you. Do with it what you will. In your strong name I pray. Amen. Come on, let's celebrate what God's doing in people's lives today. Amen.